Hello again and welcome to the Great British Woodshop. Today I'm going to build one of the most useful pieces of furniture you can have in your house, a corner cabinet. It's a good weekend project and on a recent trip to the Lake District we found a couple of great examples. The village of near Sowery has long delighted visitors with its pastoral charm and beautiful rolling landscapes and for many years the property known as Hilltop was home to Beatrix Potter. She, of course, was known for what she called her little books, like The Tale of Peter Rabbit and The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. And here in the house at Hilltop, you can actually find a lot of pieces that were featured in Beatrix's books, like this 18th century long case clock. There's a beautiful hand-painted face on it. And this piece was illustrated in The Tailor of Gloucester. And she illustrated this 19th century dresser in The Tale of Samuel Whiskers. Now over here is the range, and Beatrix actually did some of her cooking here. She would draw hot water from this reservoir at the bottom to fill a bath, and this hot plate kept the kettle warm for afternoon tea. Well here in the parlour is the piece that I actually brought you to see. It's a corner cupboard. Now corner cupboards are glass fronted, or solid fronted, or open fronted, but one thing they all have in common is that they're great for taking up the dead space in the corner of a room. Now Beatrix used this glass fronted cabinet to display her favourite china. But I think we're going to develop our piece for use in a kitchen. Well the pieces up at Hilltop were made from dark mahogany and they were quite formal. I've gone for a much more country style piece and I've made this out of southern yellow pine. Now I've added some scallopy details around here and I'm going to call this the Austrian corner cabinet. Down the bottom there's a little shelf that you could put a pot plant on or some little uh, statue. And this is a flat panel door with some antique hinges. And I've added some moulding around the inside of the panel. And I did a little bit of carving on these corner pieces too. Inside we've got an adjustable shelf. And because this is a real country kitchen style of piece, I put a fairly simple moulding at the top. The first thing I'm going to do is start working on these side panels. And I'm going to cut those to length and width over the table saw. When I picked up the stock for this project down at the timber yard, the boards were wide enough to get my side panels out of one piece, but wide boards have a tendency to cup. So I ripped three pieces out of those boards and then I rearranged them so I could get some alternating growth rings. Now you can see on this board quite clearly the growth ring pattern goes this way on this piece, goes down on this piece and comes up on this piece. And that should keep this board nice and stable in service. Now I take workshop safety very seriously. When I'm here on my own, I always make sure that the safety guards are in place. It's an important part of shop safety, as are safety glasses and hearing protection. Now I can cut this board to 285mm wide and 736mm long. The side pieces get cut at a 90 degree angle up at the front and they get beveled at a 45 degree angle down here at the back where it meets this narrow back piece and I'm going to make this cut over on the table saw. The side panels join to this back piece and I've already beveled that at a 45 degree angle on both sides. The next pieces I want to work on are these front panels and they both get the same treatment. A 90 degree cut here at the back but in the door opening that's a 22 and a half degree angle. I've tilted the saw to 22 and a half degrees and I'll make those cuts next. Now with the saw tilted back to zero and the fence set to 140, I can now cut it to the final width. And when I made the original, I made a template for the top and bottom shelves, and this is one of them here. Now that's created by running a rebate around all edges of the panel, and that leaves a 6mm tongue. And that's what fits into these grooves I'm about to, to uh, route into these panels next. One down here, about halfway down, which is the bottom, and then one up here at the top, for the top shelf. And I can't get my normal straight edge guide on this board because it's beveled, so I've just clamped a piece of wood there. I've got a six millimeter straight cutting bit installed in the router and I've set the depth to six mil. And I'll make all the cuts on these panels the same way. Well, here are all our pieces for the main part of the cabinet laid out. And I continued on and cut grooves for the top and the bottom part of the cabinet. Now this side panel gets a tongue cut here that fits in a groove that I'm going to run all the way down the inside edge of the front panels and I'm going to do that over on the router table. I've got a six millimeter bit installed in the router 
and I've set the fence the correct distance away and I've raised the bit up so it's six mil above the surface of the table. Well next I'm going to cut a couple of rebates in these side panels and I've set a different bit in the router now, a much larger bit and I've set it up so that after I've finished cutting the rebate I'll be left with a six mil by six mil tongue and that's going to fit into those grooves we just cut. And this is all pretty precariously held together at the moment, I'm just using that MDF shelf template to hold it so I can show you this construction technique. And you can see here this is the back where these two pieces join and this will go into the corner and then up here we've got the tongue and the groove that we just cut. Now you'll notice that this little piece here sticks out and that's on purpose because that's an old cabinet maker's trick so that you can take care of any irregularities that there are in the wall. With this extended out on both sides only this edge will touch the wall. The next thing I want to do is cut a stopped groove in both of the side panels and that's where this fixed shelf is going to be housed. I'll do that with a 19mm straight cutting bit installed in the portable router and I've installed a straight edge guide and I've also marked the line where I'll stop the cut. Now this is the profile that I want to add to the bottom of the side panels and I just freehanded this out and cut it out, it's just a piece of cardboard and then I laid it down on top of the side panel traced a pencil line around it and I'm now going to cut this out with a jigsaw and I'll just stay proud of the line by a couple of mil and then I'll sand it back to the line on the oscillating spindle sander. I created a different template for the two front panels but the process is still the same. I marked a line and I'm going to cut it just proud with the jigsaw and then I'll sand it back with the oscillating spindle sander. Well here are all the pieces for the main part of the cabinet and they're all laid out in order and when they're assembled they're held together by this bottom panel and top panel and as you can see in here there's a considerable number of angles on these that need to be cut and I'm going to do that over at the table saw using my sliding miter gauge. Now there's going to be four 45 degree cuts made on the top and bottom panel and the first thing I did was establish a center line and I calculated these measurements based on the inside dimension of the cabinet and then added six mil all the way around because later I'm going to make a tongue that'll go around the outside and that will sit in those grooves that we cut in the side panels. I've set the stop on my sliding miter gauge to the correct distance and now I'm going to adjust it to the 45 degree angle and then I'll make my first cut. And now I can just rotate the board around, put that edge up against the fence and make the final cut. Now I'm going to create a tongue on these boards by cutting a rebate. And a couple of these edges are going to be a little tricky particularly this short piece here at the back. But I'm a bit worried that as I push this board through it might wobble away from the fence and it'll spoil that edge. So I'm going to use my sliding miter gauge in conjunction with the fence. Now the only way you can do that is if the mitre slot and the fence are perfectly aligned. Now the longer sides so I can just push by hand up against the fence. I've just dry assembled the cabinet just to make sure that it all fits and it does so while I've got it dry assembled I'm drilling two pilot holes through this back panel into the shelves or the top and bottom of the cabinet and that's the only two screws that will be in this project to hold it together the rest of it will be held by glue. Now the adjustable shelf sits on three of these little spoon pins and they sit in a series of holes that I drilled in the back panel and also on the inside of these two front pieces. And here's one of the front panels and the first thing I did was draw a center line between the groove and the front and then I've put a mark where I want my two outside holes to be and I'm going to use the center line of my jig to line up with the line that I drew on the stock. And then I'm just going to line up by eye the center of the pinhole with the center of the jig hole. I've installed a five millimeter straight cutting bit in the router and this bush and the bush will sit perfectly in the jig holes and then all I need to do is plunge it down to make the cut and I've set the depth to 10 mil. 
And this is the fixed shelf, and I've notched out the corners here so that this section can sit in the stopped grooves that we cut in the side panels earlier. And the next thing I want to do is add this decorative bead around the front of this shelf. And I'm also going to do the same to the shelf that'll sit in the upper part of the cabinet. To do that, I've set up a classic bead cutter in the router table. The scalloped face strip gets cut out of this piece of stock, and it gets cut at 22 and a half degrees on each end. Now I'm going to cut it a little bit long, and then I'll trim it exactly until it fits into the opening. Well, that's a good start, but it's still probably a couple of mil off, so I'll keep nibbling it away until it fits. Now I'll start marking out for those decorative scallops. And then I'm going to cut this back again with the jigsaw, and I'll probably need a couple of different sanding drums on the oscillating spindle sander to get into these really tight corners. I'm just adding some nice sharp detail to this scalloped edge with a little half round file. When we come back from break, I'm going to start gluing up the cabinet. Welcome back to the Great British Woodshop. Today's project is an Austrian corner cabinet. Before the break, we made all the pieces for the main carcass, and I'm ready to glue that up now. now. I've attached the top panel to the back with a single screw and some glue, and the next piece to go in is this side panel. It gets glue in the trench and also up the bevel. I'll do that to both sides. Next, I'll put some glue on the rebates around the base panel, and that gets slipped into its slots and then I'll attach that to the back panel with a single screw. And the front panel gets some glue in the grooves, and that slots in to the side panel. I'm using this band clamp, just setting these knuckles into the corner. And they're adjustable, so they sit, doesn't matter how you position them, they'll sit on the angle that you need them to. Next thing I want to do is just put a couple of clamps across here. Just hold this corner together. Next, a little bit of glue on this scalloped piece. Just sits over this tongue that we cut before. I'm going to hold that in place and help pull it all together. I'm going to slide the band clamp up over the top of it. And the last bit to get attached in this glue up is this top part of the face frame, and that goes on the front. And now I'll drop the bottom clamp to hold that piece securely in place. Well, the main feature of this cabinet has to be the door. It's a flat panel door, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to add this octagonal moulding around the inside. And I also added some little carved details in the corners. And the style has a groove that runs all the way down the inside. Now I'm going to make those cuts next. I've also cut the grooves in both of the rails, and I've cut a tenon on one of these rails here at the top, and that tenon slots into the groove like that, and that creates this space in here where the door panel is going to sit. And I cut those tenons over on the table saw, and I've set up a reference stop against the fence, and that will give me the correct length of the tenon, and I'll make a pass over the blade, and then I'll slide the board over and nibble away the rest, and then I'll flip it over and make the cut on the other side, and that'll create the tenon. Now, before I said that this was a flat panel door, and indeed it is, but if you have a look on the back side, you'll notice that it's beveled. It's a raised panel on the inside, and that makes for a more stable and stronger door. Now, to raise that panel, I'm going to use this jig. It has a little stop at the back, and that enables me to put the stock up against it safely, and the little slots through the top enable me to clamp the board to the jig. I've tilted the saw over to 15 degrees and the jig will just ride over the top of the fence and I'll make four cuts to raise the panel. I'm just going to apply a little bit of glue to the tenons and I'll put a little bit in the groove as well. The door panel doesn't get any glue, it just sits in those slots because you always want the door panel to move with any changes in moisture content within the wood. 
Now the flat panel gets trimmed out with some of this octagonal moulding and I've put some little carved corner blocks in the corner. Now the measurements for the corner blocks are 70mm by 70mm and that gave me the length for this first piece of moulding and also of course for all four corners. The next thing I did was to measure between this point and this point and that gave me the length for this top piece and the bottom piece and when it came time to cut this one I just filled in the gap. They all get cut at 22 and a half degrees over on the compound miter saw. Let's see if this piece fits. That goes in there nicely. Next I can start cutting out these triangle pieces. And I'm going to set the saw to 45 degrees. Now this little arrowhead detail up here gets cut with a power carver. And it comes with interchangeable gouges. And it just vibrates. And as it comes in contact with the wood, it makes the cut. And I'm just going to make three grooves to get that arrowhead. I'm just giving the door a sand now with my random orbit sander and some 120 grit paper. Because once the trim goes in, I won't be able to get to it later. I'm using a wood moulding glue here. It sets fast. It's white, so it dries clear. And it doesn't drip or run. And with those pieces in place, I'll start putting on this octagonal trim. Well, with that glue squeezed into the profile of that trim, you've got to get it out now with a damp sponge because you'll never be able to sand it later. Plus, any glue that's on the surface of the wood will prevent the finish from taking to the wood properly. Now, I'm just going to put a couple of blocks of wood on top of this to weight the moulding down and hold it in place for about 10 minutes while it dries. The cornice moulding is made up from two separate pieces of stock. This bottom piece here is made up using an OG bit and the top one it gets rounded over at the top and the bottom with two different size rounding over cutters. I've installed a 12.7mm rounding over bit in the router table and I've attached a couple of feather boards. This one on the fence will keep the stock tight against the surface of the table and this one here will hold it tight against the fence. And I'm doing that because I don't want the stock to wander away from the cutter and spoil the profile. Now I've swapped the cutter over for a 6.3mm rounding over bit and now I'm going to make the second pass to finish creating that top moulding. Now with the Roman OG bit installed in the router table I can cut the second half of the cornice moulding. Here's our two pieces of moulding for the cornice and this top board here is going to fit over the top of this one like that. But this needs to sit in a little rebate that I'm going to create all the way down the face of this board and it's going to be a couple of mil thick. So I've set the height on the saw table to be exactly the same height as this board is and I've installed a couple of feather boards on the saw table to keep the stock firmly up against the rip fence and now I can push them through. Now that's created a little hockey stick moulding and that edge will sit straight over the top of the other one like that. Now the next thing I want to do is run the same type of cut down the OG moulding piece and that'll create a rebate that will sit over the top of the cabinet. Now I can cut this moulding to the correct length. I'm going to start by sliding it down until it's flush with the back of the cabinet. Hold it in place and then just put a mark at the intersection of the first bend. And a little orientation mark to help me not get confused when I come to the saw to cut it. I've set the miter saw to 22 and a half degrees to make the cut. I'm using some more of this wood moulding glue and I'm going to be gluing and nailing as I go. And I'll be fastening it with a couple of 30mm finish nails. Now I've trimmed this end off and I'm going to slide it up against the piece we just nailed in place. And then mark this end. And I'll repeat the exact same process for the top part of the moulding. Well, I'm pretty happy with how the cornice mouldings turned out. Now I need to fit the door into this opening. Now remember, the front panels were beveled at 22 and a half degrees. And I'm going to put the same bevel on the door. And I'm going to keep nibbling away at that at the table saw until I get that door to fit in that opening exactly right. Now for the final trim on the door, I just rested the hinges in the opening because they're surface mounted hinges and they're about a millimetre thick and that took up some space. But now the door fits fine. I'll take it out and I'm going to mark the positions where we're going to attach these hinges. 
Now the hinges get set at 40 mil from the top and bottom of the cabinet. And I'm not going to drill any pilot holes for these screws because this is softwood and it just doesn't need it. So I'm just going to mark the center as a starter hole with this brad awl. With the hinges attached to the cabinet, let me show you how I marked out for the door. Now I sat the door in the opening and then folded the leaf up and put a little mark where the two outside edges of the leaf were. And then I extended those lines around with my square and then I brought the door up against the leaf of the hinge and just by keeping the door the same distance away from the cabinet and then I marked two holes. But before I attach the door I'm going to drill a hole for the knob. Well before we can put the finish on our corner cabinet the only thing to talk about now is how we're going to hang it to the wall. And I know this is a French cleat nothing more than a piece of wood cut at a 45 degree angle and the piece that goes on the wall is cut at a reciprocal 45 degree angle and the two pieces just rest on top of each other. Well the first thing I did was to take some flat stock and I beveled it at 45 degrees on both edges and that's the part that sits against the wall. Next I'll cut it in half and attach one piece to the cabinet. Well here's the French cleat attached to the back of the cabinet and the other thing I did was to add a magnetic catch on the door. That'll just help keep that door closed. Now the finish I've chosen for this project is an antique pine and it's a water-based finish. And when I made the original I did a series of test pieces and I keep these for future reference. And I tried just about everything to get the color I wanted. I tried some with a sanding sealer and a spirit dye with a sanding sealer and a water-based dye. I put it on with a rag, I put it on with a brush, and at the end of the day, I finally came up with a combination that I liked the color of, and that was this one here. And what I did to get that look was to wet the entire cabinet down to raise the grain, and then I gave it a final sanding with some 320 grit paper, and I've done that to our cabinet. So the next thing to do is to apply this stain, and I'm gonna use one coat, and I'll just put it on with a rag and I'm keeping the rag moving not letting any of the stain pool so I can keep an even color and you can see that golden brown coming out already and once this is finished I'll buff it off and I'll give it a coat of neutral wax and then all I gotta do is find a place to hang it well I finally decided to put this piece in the study I don't know what I'm gonna put in it yet but it was a fun project to build I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did I'm David Free and this is the Great British Woodshop and I hope to see you again soon.